travel zone restriction ahead. Make sure you have the required permit to proceed. What? Environmental what? zone restriction ahead. Make sure you have the required permit to proceed. I'm Mike. And I'm Danny. And this is Petra Revolt. some beats going up here. Don't watch the cyclists. I always get pissed off when someone passes me too close. Straight up, yeah? yeah. Perception of speed feel like compared to a super bike and Danny? I, well, I mean, it feel, you can feel the bumps a lot more, but it's like, um, I think with with being on the roads and it all being closed in, it feels quite quick, and the acceleration feels quick in it. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not used to going fast on the road. When I, when I drive my car, I drive it like Miss Daisy. So when I uh, when I get behind something like this, but it just makes you want to just when you can hear the roar and you can just feel that bit of power behind you. You just want to open it up a bit. drove anything, anything near this fast on the road. Oh, it's got a good traction control package, so even if you get a bit out of shape like that, it'll always keep you on the straight and narrow. <laughs> it just makes you want to play. I tell you what though, it's a nice car, even though like I'm a bit excited and I feel like just going flat out everywhere in it. It's a nice car to drive at a normal speed as well. It's quite easy to drive at a normal speed. If you didn't want to make a lot of progression, you can just tickle it along and it drives like a normal car, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It's a it's a, it's a comfortable car. Like, you, you don't feel like it's too rigid, you know? You know, normally like a lot of sports cars, you, you feel like they're real rigid and But this feels quite, um, feels nice. It does feel rigid, but not. Shame we're not going around the Isle of Man, really. I know my way around that. Italian driving style, driving on the horn. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, it, is, it, is a it is a beautiful car to drive. Confidence inspiring, isn't it? Yeah, it is, and just, you know, like just hearing that engine note, it's beautiful you just want to you just want to 
keep accelerating in it. Like you can, but like now we're in fourth gear and you can just trundle along, can't you? It's not like I mean, I think me being a bit of a bike racer and knowing I've got a bit of power underneath me, I want to um, give it a bit of a blast. But you could, you'd happily just love to go out for a bit of a um, just like a Sunday cruise, couldn't you? In this and not not want to go silly in it sort of thing and it's a beautiful car to pull up you know to pull up to places I'm sure it will draw a lot of attention to you and it's um, it's nice it's a nice you could do a long journey in it put it that way yeah you wouldn't have thought looking at it that it'd be a comfortable GT cruiser but it is you can really sit in these seats and they hold you quite well and it's not too loud the suspension is not too hard and you can cruise quite a long distance in it. You felt them carbon brakes yet? Yeah. That's something else, isn't they, them brakes? Not that I'm not confident in the brakes, but I'm not confident in doing it on the road. To um, There's too many dangers around me to for something to go wrong. <laughs> At least on a track, you know, if something goes wrong, you can go straight on. It's a beautiful car, though. I mean, look at the interior. Proper Italian style, isn't it? Hand-stitched. It's... Oh, you could look at the interior all day long. Yeah, it's really nice. Definitely crafted for those who enjoy the finer things in life. Yeah it, yeah, it is, yeah. It's just a classy car, like, you know, it looks cool, it looks mega sporty on the outside, but on the inside, it's it's class. It's pure class, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, a lot of this leather, it just looks like handbag-grade leather, and you don't even have to touch it to know it. You know, it just looks expensive. I can't believe I'm... Uh driving a car how much is it worth well if it went to auction it would probably be a couple of bidders that were bidding against each other to get this car because it's british racing green right hand drive it's one of one because there there aren't there isn't another car the same spec as this i'm pretty confident it would go for 650k normal v12 cigars tend to go at auction for about 550k but but this one has got something special about it which would mean it would go in a collector's lineup more than your normal Zagato would do. Makes me nervous even more driving uh, knowing it's that sort of price. How much is tire, like tyres for one of these things, one of these cars? Uh, they're on 20 inch Pirelli P0s. Um, I think they're, they're pretty normal. They're, about 295 for the rear each, 250 for the front each. Uh, that's normal, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Not 80 quid. I get the budget tyres put on my car, 80 quid for rear tyres. <laughs> I'll stick with that, I think. <laughs> I think it's 80 quid for a rear and 45 quid for a front. <laughs> Mind you, you have no grip on them, but. By the 20 inch. Freddy P zeros that are fitted to this car, but below a tarmac temperature of about seven degrees, and they've got hardly any grip at all. You've got to be really careful. So, would you say like the the tyres what are fitted to this car, would they be would that be a good tyre, say for a track day? Yeah, it's more track day focused performance than it is road car. The other Astons have got Bridgestones fitted to them, but it's better to fit the Michelin Pilot Sports. But 
when you get the tread blocks hot on those tyres round a track, they go a bit squidgy. You certainly notice it coming into corners. Whereas the Pirelli P0s, they don't go squidgy when they're hot and they're a more track orientated tyre. So you could, yeah, you could say that the Pirellis might be a bit, um, a bit more stiffer. Yeah, you can certainly feel that uh, in this car now, and you can also hear a little bit of road noise, a bit of tyre noise, yeah. uh, because it has got a more track-focused tyre on. Whereas I should think with the other tyres, if you took them on a track day, it would be, um, they w I should think, because you'd be going that much quicker, they wouldn't last as long, would they? Yeah, they'll definitely overheat real quick. You'll notice it couple of laps into a track session. Because on, on the bikes we obviously have, in super bikes we have slicks, um, but like the super stock classes they have to run like a dreaded tyre, so almost like, it's like, it is a, it's a road going tyre, um, but obviously made for the, more for the track, but if you want to, you know, them tyres are within the road legal limit, so I'm assuming that's pretty much which is on what's, what's on here, isn't it? Yeah, I, in some classes of Aston Martin owners racing, they do specify an E-Mark tyre as the control tyre, um, but that E-Mark tyre is no more track focused than this Pirelli P0. Right. I'll tell you what you do feel in this car. You feel well protected. You know, it doesn't feel like, um, it doesn't, it is, a, it is a sports car, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily feel like a sports car, you know? Yeah, well the crash standard of these cars are phenomenal. And even if you've seen a rolled car, then I've seen them where you can still open the doors. Uh, they are that strong. The only thing is you wouldn't want the repair bill of this car because every single panel is carbon. There you go, Danny, you've earned that. Oh, you got me. Nice. Is that Italian? Italian beverage to go with your Italian-styled Aston. Oh, see, si, grazie, grazie. That was a good Cheers. Italian accent, wasn't it? Cheers. Well, it speaks working for a living, pulling up here in your Aston, doesn't it? It does, yeah. It's the first time I've pulled up somewhere in a, in a nice car and I certainly turned a lot of heads anyways. I mean, it, it just goes to show how iconic, you know, this Segato is. Oh, wherever you go, this particular Aston just gets lots of camera attention. Yeah, I can drive a normal Aston, and there's a lot of the times where it will go unnoticed. Your petrol station, wherever it is you stop, but you pull up anywhere in this, and just immediately cameras come out, and everyone starts talking to you about it. It's just got that, it has got that different look to it, hasn't it? It's got that, the, the Italian style to it, and it does just, I mean, it almost looks as cool as me sitting here with my coffee, doesn't it? So it's the first time you've been to Caffeine Machine, Danny? Yeah, I, to be honest, I didn't even know it was here. Obviously, I know a lot of the, the bike, the bike calves, you know, Squires, uh, um, there's one down towards Dover as well. I forgot, I forgot what that one's called, but I didn't even know this was here. And I mean, even a day like today, it's a week, it's in the week and it's quiet, but you know, we've got a handful of bikes, some nice cars here. We've turned up in, in this, which has turned a lot of heads. It's just a brilliant place and it, I want to come back. I want to come back on a weekend and just, just to come and have a look at the cars and the bikes, what are going to turn up on the weekend. Oh, it's so refreshing to see petrol -led culture being celebrated because so often it's being demonised and uh, you can come to a place like this and just celebrate it. You can and it's just, it's just a cool place, you know, like with the TPs and stuff like that and just be able to sit out and have a drink and have a coffee or have a beer and 
go in there and you know I've bought the dog some dog biscuits and a and a scarf each because you don't you don't get it's weird but you don't see them sort of things do you you know putting even like a dog and a an automotive culture together you don't get it you don't see it anywhere do you and I think that's where they've done the marketing trick on me and uh, <laughs> I've spent a bit of money but uh, but no it's just uh, yeah it's a, it's a real cool place so nice bright blue sky day what would you sooner roll up in? Your Aston Zagato or your RG500? This is the thing, this is like... The thing is, bikes to me, it's... It's the first thing, you know, I've, I've done bikes, I've raced bikes since I was six years old. I've always been around them. They are special to me, but I don't know, I suppose just because it's more... Bikes are normal to me, I think I just want to turn up in this you know with people turning around and, and having a look at it when we drove in yeah i think i just prefer to turn up in this but then again if bikes come in and you know between a four a four stroke wouldn't really turn my head but a two stroke would but yeah i think for me i'll turn up in a car nice and warm anyway well i mean today need... today's nice weather but you know yeah i like i like i like the heater on and be nice and comfy especially in this it's a, it's a nice comfy drive you need the car to take your dog biscuits and scarves and all your merchandise that you bought home, don't you? Yeah, you do. You need a bit of boot space, don't you? So, <laughs> yeah, come here and buy some merchandise. But they have got some real cool stuff here. Yeah, I, I come here midweek sometimes. Obviously, it's a lot busier here then. Get a good mix of cars and bikes. Uh, you can get exotic stuff like this, which is great to see. But what I really love to see are cars that are, are built, not bought. So someone's put a lot of blood sweat and tears into creating their car you know it um it doesn't have to be an exotic to turn heads and and that's what somewhere like this is all about it's just celebrating petrol culture yeah and like, like you say i think when people bring their own things here their own bikes and cars here what they've put their own work into and you know, they've gone to a, a private guy to build something for it. It's different, isn't it? It's unique and you you get to see the passion in, in people. And also you get, it's it's a mixture of culture between the car and the bike culture because you get the people who have turned up in their cars, their pride and joy. And then you get people turn up on their bikes, their pride and joy, and they all like looking at them both. You know, it's something, both cultures have got something in common with and when you have that it's it's an amazing chemistry isn't it it's it's weird to talk about it like that but it's a passion we only know i suppose and, and us petrol heads only know so you work on astins and you're around astins on a daily basis now for me obviously this car is well out of my price range but Not mine <laughs> um what what sort of what sort of person would own one, uh, an Aston, a normal Aston Martin, and then a, a car like the Zagato. Well, a car like this, you know, you're 650, 700k's worth of car, that's going to be parked in a garage that belongs to a three million pound mansion. Uh, it's not going to be parked in a garage of any lesser extent uh, pad than that. There's, a, there's, I see a few different owners. One will be petrol head that this isn't a collector's car. It is part of their collection for the values that it it stands for, the styling, but the performance. And they'll use it, this car is used. Uh, it's not parked up in a collection. And then you get other owners that, perhaps the car is a, a step stone to a lifestyle. So the sort of events that they will go to need a car like this to arrive in but the type of garage that we are you know we're not a franchise dealer uh, we're an independent and we you know performance modify cars and, and repair and service cars pretty much 99 percent of our customers are going to be total petrol heads and they will eat at one extreme they'll eat baked beans on toast for a year to afford their car and at the other extreme uh, you know there are owners like this that can easily afford their luxury Aston. I suppose owners like this would, you know, like they would come to you and want to get upgrades on their Astons and stuff like that. So they are the people who haven't just, like you say, gone out and bought an Aston to, 
look like they've got that lifestyle, you know, just because it's got the Aston badge on it. But, but you know, people who would own a car like the Zagato, like you say, can afford to put upgrades on like bigger brakes or, you know, um, a bit of tuning to the engine and stuff like that. Yeah, well, that's the same with this Aston. You know, the owner uses this. The engine's 510 horsepower standard. That this had our high lift inlet cams, exhaust manifolds and cats, ECU remap and these dyno at 600 horsepower with that modification. These cars came out with fixed rate dampers, which as you know from driving it, it it's not harsh, but if you wanted a, a soft, comfy cruise mode, then this car doesn't give you that. So we put an electromagnetic um, switchable suspension system in this car so that you can press a button and you can go into magic carpet ride uh, smoothness for that long motorway journey. So, you know, even though this is a pretty special car, the owner has then made it perform how he wanted it to because he isn't that person, like, like I just said, using the Aston as a stepstone to a lifestyle. He actually wants to drive this for that performance sports car experience. And I suppose get the best of both worlds. Like, you know, he can go on a long drive and, in it and it'd be nice and comfy, but then he can switch modes in it and then he can go and take it on a racetrack. <laughs> He has actually taken this on a racetrack and uh, yeah, fair play to him because he didn't hang about either. He's braver than me anyway. So we've driven this car on the road, you've sampled it round the track and you got your eye in quite well on the last couple of laps we had. Uh, sitting around it, taking it here, driving it, what, what's, your, what's your final sort of lasting thoughts of this car i mean it's a phenomenal car like i mean you look at it now and the brakes on it are huge obviously being used to the speeds of you know racing superbikes and things like that so the speed of it on the circuit wasn't a big shock but the braking power on it was just phenomenal i mean we noticed you know at the beginning i was braking way too early and then i got later and later and later and later and harder on the brakes and the car seemed to like it, you know, it, tra it tracked the track really well, it, it tracked the surface, it was doing everything I wanted it to do, so that was amazing. But then driving it on the road, the speed perception was a lot higher, you know, it felt fast because you got a lot more stuff around you, I think, you got stuff flying past you quicker and so, and I think that might be because, maybe because I don't ride a road bike, you know, so I don't, I'm never doing, okay, I've done the TT and that, but you're you're at a different mindset, you know, and, and you're sort of expecting it. Whereas I drive my car like Miss Daisy, and then when I've gotten this and give it a bit of a boot, it's like, Jesus, you know, you can you can feel the speed of it. And then, you know, on the road, you don't break that heavy on the road. Well, you shouldn't be breaking that heavy on the road, people, you know, you've got to stick to, stick to the speed limits. But on the track, just the, the way it handled, you can push the car to its limits. The braking power was unbelievable. Couldn't believe how late you could brake. So it's just giving me that feeling to wanting to get into a bit of a, a, well, a race car and just see what a race car feels like now compared to this. Well, I think we've got that to come. You've already had your eyes on uh, our GT4 car, so. Yeah, I've been sniffing around it, haven't I? <laughs> But um, I mean, obviously you being around cars a lot more than me, what's your thoughts and your vision on this car? Because it was obviously, I probably got a different view on it to you because I'm never, I don't spend that much time around cars like this. Yeah, I, I've been around Aston's for practically 20 years and I've become a bit numbed to the novelty of it. I, you know, I don't get a novelty seeing or sitting in an Aston. So that driving part of it for me was like business as usual, but what us filming the programme on Zagato, what isn't business as usual is interviewing Ian Callum. You know, even when I worked at Aston, engineers would never be around the designers. Uh, they'd work in their studio, wouldn't be part of the main company. And to sit and chat and talk to the designer about where his creativity came from and keeping that original design through the process of the car passing all legislation crash and, and, and everything and still maintaining its original link to the sketches that they first did that whole process and talking to Ian about it was uh, pretty awesome if you remember what he said on the classic Vanquish is that that car was supposed to be a lot more slimline 
uh, through the door sections than what it was. Uh, but they had to fatten the car out just because they were carrying over a Ford uh, door barrel lock that was quite long. So just understanding the fight that the designer has to keep the car original to the sketches throughout the design process, that was interesting. I, it was interesting yeah. to listen to Ian talk about uh, the design of this car and you can see it's not as clean uh, or as classic and understated as his designs would be. And he can tell you what lines on this car uh, make it that way and what he wouldn't have done. I mean, that makes you appreciate his style because it is uh, totally unique. Yet this car has still got some striking lines and still works, although in a classic sense to someone like Ian, it sort of doesn't 100% work. That whole conversation with Ian was, uh, was wonderful. And, you know, car designers can be, uh, you know, quite fiery, temperamental characters. And Ian is just so down to earth and so humble. You know, he's got a portfolio like no other car designer. Uh, he's been awarded the CBE. You know, he's pretty much a superstar in, in car, car design terms. Yet he's so down to earth and humble. And then when he said his favorite car that he gets the most reward of driving was the mid nineties Mini Cooper. That was just awesome. You know, we look after his Vanquish and he's got quite a car collection. He could pretty much have whatever car he wants. Yet if he has to name the car that he gets the most driving pleasure from, it's a mid-90s Mini Cooper. It's difficult to, to understand, but I suppose it might be a little bit like us on the RG500. I'm assuming, that, well, on the Mini, you won't have no driver aids, you won't have, you know, there, there's nothing like that. I suppose it's just you, the car, the steering wheel, and your, your clutch brake and throttle. And, you, you know, like we've done with the RG, it's got, the RG has no rider aids or anything like that. And I'm assuming it's just got to be the, the same with the Mini, you know, it feels like a little go-kart. And I mean, I know a lot of modern day motorcycle racers, if they got on an RG, they would think, what's this sort of thing? But, you know, having sort of, for myself, grown up on two strokes and that, I love it when I get back on that. And I suppose it might be the same, the same for him. I don't know, I can't answer for him, but I suppose you get that sense of just connecting with the car and connecting with everything. Yeah, I, what you said about the you know the sports bike rider getting on the RG and thinking what's this coming on to our program about the RG with Mark when we had the Sheen bike looking at the road bike. Yeah, Mark was actually looking at that frame, looking at the road bike frame and saying, well, do you know what the the road bike frame is probably better. When you got on my RG and took it round the track, uh, I was expecting you to say. You know, these road tyres, uh, it's a road bike, it's nothing like the race bike that you rode. You, I was expecting you to come back and say, you know, what's this? But, you know, you loved it. Yeah, no, it, it just put a smile on my face. And I think that's the thing with, with, I suppose, cars and bikes. You know, when you've got them classic cars and bikes where you haven't got no rider rage, you you know, it's just down to you and the feeling with the bike. And it's just a different, it's just a different feeling. And, you know, the grip and that was, obviously, it, it was a cold day when we, when we rode your RG, so you couldn't, really push it but you know of course there's bound to be a little bit of difference with grip and stuff like that but it was still really enjoyable to ride i like to have a go around it on a, <laughs> on a nice warm track so yeah i mean to to kick petrol revolt off we've had two cracking examples one one great bike one great car and we've got uh, we've got some more to come obviously we're going to go to the tt and make a, a program out of the tt I think you've got some interviews for us lined up. We'll catch a bit of bike action. Yeah, it's going to be uh, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be nice actually for me to stand on the other side, you know, because the, obviously the last time I've I've been to the TT and the classic TT, um, I've been racing and you, I cannot explain the nerves. You know, I was at the the MCN motorcycle show back in. February, beginning of Feb, and I was talking to Dom Herbertson, the TT rider, and, and we was talking about nerves and stuff like that, and I was pleased to know that they had the same nerves as me, because literally throwing up in a port before you used to get on and put your helmet on and 
that's how nervous you used to get, you know. So it's going to be nice to go there and just be on the other side of the fence for once, watch, enjoy yourself, maybe have a beer and just, uh, yeah, just chill out. You don't think you'll get some thoughts that you wish you were on the other side? Oh, you know what, maybe I would if I hadn't done it before, but, you know, the time on the road racing and that, I've called time on it and um, I'm so glad I've done it because there is no other feeling like it. You know, I don't care what anyone says in the world racing around the TT, the feeling, the adrenaline rush you get from it is incredible. And for circuit racers, if they've not done the TT before, I don't think, I had a lot of respect for them before I'd done the TT, but then when I'd done the TT, my respect just went through the roof again. So um, yeah, you know, the it's gonna be a good year. Obviously McGuinness, I think he, he starts his 100th race this year at the TT, which is gonna be incredible. He's back with Honda. You know, obviously you got Hickey, uh, you got Dunlop on the Ducati, which I think is gonna be incredible. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot to look forward to. We've got more stuff to, to cover with Petrol Revolt. We've got a booster coming up, haven't we? Which which is gonna be interesting. Very fast motorcycle. So um, yeah, it's gonna be good. We've got, we've got a lot, lot to look forward to. Yeah, I'm gonna enjoy covering the Boozer because for touring, that is one bike I would consider, especially with, with its electronics package because that is a winner for me. I normally, on the previous generation Boozer, I own this great bike, it's phenomenal, engine, aerodynamics, everything about it is just phenomenal. It's just never been my type of machine. You know, for cruising, you know, I, I like my classics and I've got an old 80s Kawasaki ZX-10 and I just love that for going to the south of France and Spain in, which I have done. But it's carburetor, it's a little bit unreliable. There's no electronic aids at all, which you sort of don't need if you're touring. But like I have done, you go up a mountain pass and one side of it is in sunshine, the other is in shade and you can literally go from plus uh, temperatures on one side to minus and ice on the other so that time where you just need a rider aid just to get yourself out of trouble where uh, something unsuspecting come along that that's quite uh, quite an appeal that is and the styling on the boost uh, sort of never been my cup of tea but it's one of the last naturally aspirated large capacity bikes i sort of don't like the downsizing and the supercharging route that maybe Kawasaki are going on and if it wasn't for the ZZR 1400 being discontinued then uh, the Boozer is the next one to uh, celebrate big petrol engines in motorbikes. Yeah I mean I've, I'm the same as you I've never the Boozer's always it's never appealed to me but obviously I can't comment on it because I've never rode one um, so I'm really looking forward to riding one and like you say I'm looking forward to testing the electronics package out on it and just seeing what what can be done on it sort of thing so uh, I, I think I could be easily converted and that loan bike that Suzuki are giving us they might not actually get back might buy it off them well there you go they'd have done their job then <laughs> wouldn't they but uh, I'm looking forward to it I think it would be good and uh, I mean this program is about you know bringing petrol engines to to all the petrol heads out there. So yeah, I'm looking forward to riding it and giving giving my, my opinion on it. And I'm I'm hoping there's gotta be the ore around the booster, it's a big ore around it. So there's it's gotta be a reason behind that. So I'm looking forward to finding that reason out. Yeah, we'll take it on the track. We'll check out the rider aids. And then I think there's the Boozer Festival at the Elvington Strip at the end of what will be this month. So, um, you can run it down the drag strip there if you're brave enough. So yeah, we've got uh, some cars and bikes that we're gonna make some features out of in coming monthly petrol vault videos. Uh, one thing I'm really looking forward though is uh, our own track days. So we've got Barcelona Park Motor in July, the full Iberia circuit, 9.2 kilometers in uh, October, which I'm gonna have to get a bike for because if I take one of the RGs, along 9.2 kilometers of track with a one kilometer straight, then that motor ain't coming back from that. That's, no. Uh... I think you need to get a modern, modern day sports bike for that. I knew they'll still rip your arms out because they're, they're an animal now, but it'd just be nice, wouldn't it? It'd be nice to, bit of sunshine, drive some nice cars around some tracks and some nice bikes and uh, yeah, it'd be the perfect petrol head holiday, wouldn't it? Well, you're up for giving a bit of rider coaching on that for people that come along to our bike days. We'll take our GT4 and we'll give you a bit of coaching in the GT4. Should be quite a nice couple of days. Yeah, it'd be good, you know. I mean, obviously we've got experienced guys like you in the car side of things and then myself on the bike side of things. So we've got 
we've got enough people there to give enough people tips and tricks on cars and on bikes. So uh, yeah, look, looking forward to it and looking to you know to seeing all the customers there and enjoying themselves. Cappuccinos have run dry, and uh, it's about time we get this mistress back home. Ciao, ciao. To find out more about Petrol Revolt, then please head across to our website, petrolrevolt.com.